Uh, a very uh, warm welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Axel Threlfall. I'm editor at large uh, at Reuters, based out of London. I, I want to first apologise for the delay in starting this plenary session. We are having some technical difficulties uh, with lines from the Namibia uh, as well as Portugal uh, right now. Um, I do, though, have a video I want to play you in just a second. But let me start with a few words. This the, the title of this session is "Unite, Inspire, Create." Um, it's clearly a call for an end to what uh, many see as a rather shambolic international response to the, uh, to the pandemic and a, a clear lack of a collective agenda, uh, disunity, uh, disarray uh, were words used by the UN Secretary General recently to describe the uh, the uh, the coordinated or the lack of coordinated uh, effort. The urgency uh, of the context is is clearly lost. Uh, on no one. Uh, so, so this session um, is really about or was supposed to be about how the world deals with this as effectively, as efficiently and as equitably uh, as possible. Collaboration is a word that permeates most conversations uh, about uh, response efforts. But but more often than not, we bemoan the lack of collaboration as, as nations and communities devise their own battle plans. The literature um, for this session speaks of unity, but it also talks of the need for creativity uh, to get to where we need to get. Now, from this, I read uh, being forced to think out of the box, to work differently with one another, to reassess priorities, to be brave and to be uh, visionary. And again, that was a word uh, used by uh, Secretary General uh, Guterres. Uh, in his opening message uh, for this event. Um, these are, after all, uh, as we say, uh, again uh, and again, unprecedented times. In the meantime, I would like to play for you a brief recorded message from Michel Bachelet, the UN uh, High Commissioner for Human Rights, who was due to jo uh, join us live, but was called away uh, at the very last minute. So let's play that message now. I'm pleased to address you today at this time of multiple and massive global crisis. A climate catastrophe, a pandemic that has claimed on one million lives, a severe recession the deepest since World War II, threatening to push well over 100 million people into extreme poverty. Times of unprecedented challenges require unprecedented action. COVID-19 has shown us that our business as usual is just not good enough. We cannot go back to the normality that made our society so vulnerable, fragile, and unequal. The pandemic has brought us to a crossroads. We must, we must build back better. It demands tackling structural discrimination and addressing the inequality pandemic exposed and magnified by COVID-19. People already in vulnerable situations have suffered the worst from the health and socioeconomic impact of COVID-19. Among them are women and girls, due to long-standing discrimination and inequality. Gender equality is not an optional extra, and it cannot be cast aside in times of crisis. It is essential to peaceful, just, and resilient societies. We will not meet these challenges if we are playing with just half the team. Colleagues, in today's context, social protections can be crucial. Life-sustaining tools to enable access to health care and education, protect the right to housing and food, and shield people from extreme poverty. Social protection for all is a distant dream for most of the world's population. According to ILO, 71% of the people alive today have no social security coverage or only partial and inadequate coverage, including almost two-thirds of the world's children. There are 1.6 billion informal workers and 0.4 billion precarious workers worldwide, representing 61% of the global workforce. Women who often take jobs in the informal economy are frequently deprived of social protection. Building those social protections is the right thing to do the smart thing to do, and it is affordable. As HILO has shown, a universal social protection scheme that includes allowances for all children, maternity benefits for all women with newborns, benefits for all persons with severe disabilities, and universal old age pension will cost an average of 1.6% of a developing country's GDP. Sustainable recovery efforts will be efforts that advance universal social protection, including universal health coverage. They will integrate access to education, protect the right to housing and food, and shield people from extreme poverty. And they will be grounded in inclusive, participatory processes and ensure equal opportunities for all. 
Everyone must benefit from rights-based response and recovery efforts. And I cannot stress this enough. Any vaccine against COVID-19 must be distributed as a global public good. The Secretary General has called for a new social contract, a new global deal that creates equal opportunity for all and respect the rights and freedoms of all. For that, strong global cooperation and solidarity will be essential. I am optimistic. Together we can rebuild societies that uphold human rights. The right to life, to health, to education, to food and shelter, social security and a fair trial, freedom from discrimination of any kind, freedom of expression and the right to privacy, freedom of thought, conscience and religion, freedom from torture and from arbitrary detention. Human rights are the tools to build more stable, more peaceful and resilient societies, better ones. So thank you for standing up for them. I wish you a fruitful session. Mr. President, uh, this is Axel Global Reuters. Can you hear me okay? Good morning, good morning, good morning. Good morning to you. Um, we we want to get this discussion underway. We've only got a, a few minutes, but I, I would like to get some of your uh, overall thoughts, if I may, um, about uh, the theme, which is um, unite, um, inspire, create. Um, clearly, uh, creativity is, is, is part of what is required now. Um, the UN Secretary General has spoken of the need for uh, visionaries as well. How creative and visionary do you think world leaders have been in their response to this pandemic, Mr. President? Well, firstly, I'm glad to have been invited by you to participate but creativity is needed now because we are facing a very serious pandemic. If we are not creative in how we manage our systems in governance and nation building by holding actually hold, holding hands to stand as one world community, knowing that some countries are more poor, others are rich, but this disease is not discriminating. It has no boundaries. So we have to be creative in how to help and hold hands one another to address this pandemic. How, how, how creative do you think you have been in Namibia in your response? Uh, Namibia was, was praised, widely praised at the outset for your response to the pandemic. In August, or the end of August, you announced that initial gains were being eroded. How creative have you been? How much more creative do you need to be? We have been dreamers and we have been creative because the moment we hear about the pandemic, I declare a state of emergency and close down all the borders because we are an isolated country. We are connected to the world through the transport system. So all airlines from Dubai and so on, we close down. And that helps us to manage the system. And for a time being, we really were managing it until there was now an outbreak because of the uh, people who are coming from sea and so on. But the pandemic at the coast, serious business. But today we have zero occurrence there. We have been setting up a sender that annual, um, every morning we have been informing our people, educating them, and have been very, very transparent what we're doing, not hiding any facts. Mm, mm, mm. The, uh, as I said, though, the, the initial response was widely praised, and you've just talked us through that. But, but, but now I believe you, you have the highest rate of new infections per population on the continent. Clearly things have gone the other way. Where, where did the administration slip up uh, in its fight against the pandemic, Mr. President? Well, slipping up is... Uh, Thing that we don't expect, but uh, you know, human beings, uh, the community uh, transmissions, the community transmission in our people, in our poorer people, live together so closely. If you have uh, rich people, they have enough space. Houses are big, but our fear was in our uh, rural uh, and also in our townships where people are crowded. We are worried about that. And a, and a pandemic in Wolfies Bay was not in the white area where rich people are living. It was actually in what we used to call locations. So, but we have managed that too, because we are creative. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. I'm going to come uh, and talk a little more domest- about the domestic situation in a moment, but but back to a lack of global coll- uh, collaboration and, and multilateralism. How hard as a leader is it, Mr. President, to coordinate, to mobilize an international response when things are so difficult at home for you? And of course, many leaders are facing the same situation. Well, this is a unique situation. We were supposed to have been at the UN now, and we have been doing this virtual kind of communication. And to me, it is working. We are saving money at our homes, but I have been addressing General Assembly from here. I have been addressing other side meetings from here, of Secretary General and all of them. And I think we are holding hands. I cannot blame the big powers too much. I think they are also trying their best to really to end the poorer countries. Vaccine is being talked about, but vaccine must be their world property. It shouldn't be a business as usual, making profit. It should be the property of all of us. So we are looking towards, towards that one. And I think world is really holding hands, let me say that. From what I'm seeing, the world is holding hands. Are you, you, uh, from what you're seeing, the world is holding hands. So you sound, Mr. President, um, if I may sound a lot more optimistic than than the UN Secretary General, than the head of the, the UN uh, Human Rights Commission, um, who, who do not see a world holding hands. I, I bet I, I missed that. You, you seem a lot more optimistic than many uh, leaders uh, I have spoken to and many leaders of international organizations uh, who express oh. a real pessimism about global cooperation. You see, if I were not an uh, internal optimist, I wouldn't have been here. We went through a difficult struggle. By being optimistic, we are here today. So to me, we are tackling this uh, pandemic. Namibia, we have reduced it now, basically. I'm telling you, in Wolfie's Bay, we have zero occurrence of that. So I'm optimistic, and I'm optimistic about the future of the world. I'm thinking of building a Namibian house that will be united. I'm thinking of African continent that will be together, and a global village where we are all going to hold hands and live as people. Is one world. Let's okay. Let let me talk a little bit about specifically the the, the Namibian um, economy mm-hmm. and what we're seeing in 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 your country. Um, there is most countries are playing this this are in this quandary, this balance game between the economy keeping that going on the one hand and the health crisis uh, on the other. Um, what is the strategy in Namibia to ensure the economy rebounds in the shortest possible time? What policy measures, what fiscal measures uh, will we see uh, from Namibia? Well, first we established, uh, announced a stimulus plan to help at least first the poorest to give them allowances, which we have done in our terms about 750,000. And then we are also trying to help the businesses, uh, small and medium enterprises, by trying to also give them financial assistance, but also to provide conducive environment in which we can reopen businesses. Uh, tourism, we have already reopened because that's very important. It's creating jobs. So again, we have already opened up our borders that uh, tourists can come. They'll be confined. We check them at the airport. Once we think they are safe, it's three days and so on, they can go and be confined in a tourism area. That we're already opening up, creating jobs, again, which have been lost and so on. Mm. Again, also good governance. We we're talking about good governance, dealing with corruption, dealing with actually, uh, inclusivity. You know, we are coming from a apartheid background. So I believe in the world also. Inclusivity spells Harmony. Exclusivity is first conflict. So even if you are in Portugal or so on, and one of us here in this corner will be excluded, eventually we are forming, creating conflict. So I think in unified Namibia, unified world, unified Africa. If I may, though, I pick you up on a couple of the things you've mentioned. You, you, you talk about tourism coming back. It, it seems to me, and, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but there is still a lot of con- confusion around Namibia's international tourism revival mm-hmm. initiative. Um, 
concerning travel conditions to to Namibia. Um, it, are you are you working on clearing up that confusion, which apparently still exists? What is the confusion? There, there is. We are very from people I've spoken to. Um, a lot of confusion surrounds the international tourism revival initiative that uh, that you put in place uh, in Namibia. Uh, that it's still not clear um, what uh, uh, the traveling conditions for tourists uh, to Namibia. It's still not clear enough. No, it's clear. Germans who are the biggest uh, tourists, they come by chartered planes. Already Euro wings have landed with hundreds of tourists. They were cleared, uh, they went, and I think others that are going to open up will not have a problem. The Ethiopian Airlines is coming, where people, they are checked. They are, of course, given the test at the airport and not quarantined. And they go to the areas where they are going to be in the, our tourism areas, and they will be there freely. So I don't see there is any problem, definitely. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you for the clarification there. A um, couple of other things I wanted to pick up on, on the policy response and the fiscal response. Um, the, the, the governor of the Bank of Namibia said uh, on the 17th of September, this is a quote, even before this health crisis, our economy was contracting, unemployment was high, and our fiscal space was severely constrained, if not exhausted. Um, it was a, it seems to me, based on that, you were coming from a pretty weak base anyway. Again, what, what can we expect on the, on the, on the policy and the fiscal uh, response from, from the government now? Well, we want to open up our economy. We want to have open and transparent processes where the tenders, everything must be done in a more transparent way. We want to open up, actually, we think we have a, Sun twenty nearly all day. So solar energy, wind energy, these are the areas and blue economy of course. These are the areas that we think new investors can come in. We provide facilities, we'll be providing facilities to enable them to really explore this area not so far expo uh, uh, exploited. Sun and wind, we have the best in the world, I'm told. So those are the areas and blue economy too. Blue economy, we have Norwegian Prime Minister, we are working together on blue economy. So these are the areas we have to look into, not just gold and diamonds. Mm, mm, mm. And, 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 and Mr. President, what, what, what are you doing to reduce your reliance on imports? Clearly import, the import market has been, has been hit hard. Uh, Namibia um, has a re real reliance on imports. What are you doing to ensure a little more self-sustenance in Namibia? Well, yes, uh, no one is an island. Namibia is not an island. We are also talking about African unity. So on the one hand, we are talking about trade, not aid per se, trade. We have our resources that have been exploited without Namibians benefiting. So we are adding, talking about value addition here. Instead of just taking our raw materials out, adding value there, creating jobs there, transfer technology there, we are saying let's now add value to our own resources. Yes, we'll be open to the world, but they must come on our terms, as Chinese are saying, so that they don't come on their own terms. We must have a kind of win-win situation that we have to create, that Namibians must be trained, in job situations, uh, technology must be transferred. If we are adding value here, that will follow. Because the situation is going to be here. Jobs are created here. Diamonds are whatever is going to be uh, sorted out here and value added here. And we also will therefore transfer technology. So these are the things. Not only that, we must deal with agriculture. We have been, if you cannot provide food to your people, we depended too much on South Africa that time. The one country, so to say. Now we are two countries and we have to see that our agriculture must really be developed. It will create more jobs. The young people's unemployment is so high, but with agriculture, I think we can create more jobs and train our young people to be self 
sufficient, not just to be job seekers, but to create jobs. We, we of course, also emphasize vocational training so that people can get skills, so that they can create their own jobs. Um, another thing that you have talked um, often about is, is this reclassification of Namibia's upper middle income status, mainly because it disadvantages your ability to access um, loans, soft loans. Um, do you sometimes, Mr. President, get the sense that, that your message on this upper middle income status is being largely ignored by the international community? No, I have been saying it for a long time, and I must say, uh, lately, some people are listening to me because what I'm saying, we are proud to be a higher middle income country. We have achieved something. But that is forgetting that we come from apartheid background, where blacks were left out. So while we are a higher middle income country, which is derived aid from taking the GDP of the country, dividing in a small population, therefore getting a high per capita income. Forgetting we had apartheid here, the majority of people were left out from the mainstream economy. That's what I'm saying, and I think lately I had some voices supporting my views. So I'm not just fighting an article. I think I'm gaining something. I'm just explaining the reality. Reality in Namibia is that really GDP is something. You divide this small population there and get high per capita income. You don't think of how is that distributed. Now, mostly white people are benefiting from that. We have to be careful. I, will, I was told by World Bank once, you are a high, middle, high, high middle income country, but your problem is distribution. I asked them, now are you saying that we must take it from the white people and give it to the black? Are you going to be happy with that? Mm, 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 mm. that. Include distribution is the issue. But how do we do it? We have a class, not class, but racial situation here. Historical racial divide. Now you say we must grab from the whites and give it to black. It's not going to work. That's not our purpose here. Mm -hmm. So therefore we have to hold hands and it is help also countries who are middle and high middle income countries. President Bush in America surprised us. He waved that and gave us in his uh, what is it called? Uh, now, in, a, in, a, in this uh, project that they gave us, there were about a billion dollars mm. earned mm. from the United States, while we are a higher middle income country. Also, with PEPFA, we gain more from the United States because while we are higher. So, we have AIDS here. But then, if you just say you are a higher middle income country, what thing of a distribution thereof that is in a small hands of few people? And you are telling you are rich. It's not realistic. And you know the history. People know the history of this country. They know there was an apartheid system here that close to 80% of Namibian blacks are poor, like mm -hmm. any other African country. Now to use this mathematical formula and say you are rich is not fair. Mm -hmm. 